this is Sergio Saiz with the uh, Hedgehog Real Estate uh, Podcast. It's so good to be back again. Um, I got my partner, Sam, here. Sam, how's things going, buddy? As always, I stay really busy. And uh, I cannot believe how busy I am now. Way more than when I was and I, when I worked 40, 50, 60 hours a week. Kind of weird. Oh, yeah, well, I know. I'm, and you know what? I'm, I, I know that working full time just got in the way of you making money, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'll tell you, that's uh, that's always a challenge for people because the reality is that in anything that we do, if you want to do it really well, you really have to give time to it. It's going to be in real estate. It, you really can't say, oh, I'm only giving it a couple of hours a week. You're not doing it. I agree, man, because, you know, opportunity is there and you can't control that. Right. Yeah. Opportunity comes and go. Real estate opportunities come. But the only thing you can control is effort, how much effort you put into it. So if you want to succeed in something, you better give it 100 percent, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm glad you mentioned the, the O word, the opportunity word, because when opportunities come and here's what I want to talk about today. How do you very quickly in a quick and dirty way uh, evaluate that opportunity especially if you're not in front of your computer where you can plug in all kinds of information on a spreadsheet or what have you. So I want to talk today about how you can very, uh, very quickly evaluate a property to see if it's really, really worth going after, or at least, you know, doing more research. And I remember when I first met you, Sam, what is it about four years ago now, three, four years ago, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's gone so, by quick. 2019. Yeah, we had just, 2019. Yeah. We had just met, I mean, at, at work, Sam and I, and we were actually had, were going to lunch and somehow we started talking about real estate. And I remember asking you a couple of questions, but I asked you one important question, I think. And I say it's important because that one question over the course of time just took off as far as our real estate careers are, right? Yeah. And I, the question, I don't know if you remember this, but I asked you, hey, Sam, do you know what the 1% rule is? And oh, what I remember response? What was your I was I was driving. Uh -huh. You were in the passenger seat. We had two other guys in the back who wasn't paying attention to the conversation. I know, I know. And when the when the topic of real estate came up, because we were discussing what are we doing to supplement our income when we retire, you said you had dabbled in it. I said I had dabbled and I knew nothing. And you asked me, do you follow the one percent rule? Right. I'd never heard of it before. And so what did you do? I went home, I wrote it in my hand. I told myself, don't wash your hands. I went <laughs> home and I Googled it. And it was like in a so much info coming at me in the face. And at the time, I, I didn't get it. I just yeah. didn't get it. It took a while, but I can tell you now, I totally get it. <laughs> it's a great rule. I mean, it's more like a rule of thumb. Yeah. Um, I think prior to that, it was probably a 2% rule and then became a 1% rule. But uh, it's definitely a quick and dirty way to take a glance at something to see if it's worth your while. So what, what is that 1% rule then? So essentially, the 1% rule states that whatever rental assets you're going to purchase, the rents monthly should equal to about 1% of the purchase price. So for example, if it's a $500,000 property, you're, you, sh you should feel that if it rents for $5,000 a month, the likelihood of you making a profit on that investment is likely. If it's a $100,000 property, you hope that if it can generate about $1,000 a month in rent, 1% of it, right. then the likelihood of profitability is there. It's, it's not saying that if it doesn't hit the 1% rule, you're not going to be profitable. It's kind of just a gauge of the likelihood of profitability. There's more to it. You got to underwrite. But that's the nitty gritty. So when yeah. I look at stuff and if it's, let's say, a $500,000 property, but I know the area's rent is $2,000 a month, no way. I just walk away. Yeah. Don't even waste my time. It's a great place for someone to buy and live in, but it's not a great place to invest. Exactly. And that is the big value of it because it saves you time. Because once you get involved in real estate and if you do make some good connections with real estate agents, they're going to be sending you properties all the time. You know, I mean, maybe not so much now because of the tight, tight inventory market. But before it got, it got tight, I mean, there was just tons of, of information coming across. I know my computer screen and your computer screen, 
and you start getting phone calls and what have you. And and the real estate agents will just say, hey, hey, got this great piece of property, you know, uh, $800,000 for a fourplex, let's say. And you're going, oh, okay, that sounds good. And do you know what the rents are? Or or I would, I remember I would say, hey, have them send me the rent roll. And they would send me the rent roll. And sure enough, the, the, the rents would total up to maybe, you know, 4,500, 5,000 a month on an $800,000 property. And then one of two things would happen at that point. And I, I know this would happen with you too. You would either just say, hey, I'm not even going to waste my time. Why? You know, time is very valuable. Or depending on where the property is, I remember I would think, okay, maybe there's like a lot of upside here. And it would yeah. depend on a lot of different variables. But more often than not, I, if it was that big of a gap, I would just discard it. I'm not going to waste time. Uh, is that you know, kind there, of there is a small caveat that I've learned over the years is that the higher the price of the property, the more you can deviate from the 1% rule slightly lower. Yeah. Because two things occur. When you're talking about an $800, $900 million property, you're not going to expect a $10,000 a month rent. You might get five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 a month. But because of the value of that property, appreciation affects it more. Because it's three, four, five percent annually of a million dollars in appreciation, exactly. versus if you bought a a hundred thousand dollar property, and you're willing to deviate below the one percent, well, your appreciation, three, four, five percent of a hundred thousand, it's not enough to overcome the loss of rent and revenue. Exactly. So that's such a critical thing because it, that depends again on what your what your end goal is. Yeah. Are you a cash flow person? Or are you an appreciation person? Or are you willing to kind of blend the two in and maybe get a little bit of cash flow knowing that your appreciation may not be as high, but it's it's going to appreciate. So yeah, so if you if you know where you're at, then you can make those type of judgments on various properties. I agree. Okay, okay so good. So now we know that we have a quick and dirty way to very quickly determine, should I... Should I um, spend a little bit more time evaluating this property or I'm just not, or should I just not bother with it? But let's just say that you do have something that's right around anywhere from 0.9% to maybe one, 1.1, 1.2% of the property, right? So it's right in there. You're thinking, okay, uh, I can take that next step to see if it's worth it. So there's also a quick and dirty way to underwrite a property, right? Yeah. And for those that don't know, to underwrite a property, property just means that you figure out your sales price, you figure out what your costs are, and then you, you you subtract that out, and then you figure out how much is your mortgage, and you subtract that out, and you finally get a, pro a profit or a loss. So that's kind of in a nutshell. But if, uh, if you know that a property is going to be cash flowing a certain amount of money, okay, whatever it is. And uh, you bought, and let's just use an example. You're a $500,000 example, right? Um, and let's just say for argument's sake that it is going to give you $5,000 a month. Okay, just for argument's sake. So without even having to call the real estate agent or the owner, what do you do to figure out what the what the costs are? Because you got to know what your costs are to determine whether it's going to be worth it or not. So the, the way I do it is, first off, you got to kind of have a feel for the market you're in, meaning the area you're in. But for the most part, uh, the average area, um, the way it works is it takes about 40% of the gross revenue per year to operate. So you take this $500,000 deal, and let's just say for the sake of argument and simplicity, it meets the 1% rule. You're getting $5,000 a month. Well, mm -hmm. that's roughly $60,000 a year. Well, you subtract 40%. That's for your operating costs. We're talking about your taxes, your insurance, your utility, your maintenance, your reserves, your property management, all that stuff equates to roughly about 40%. Depending on part of the world and part of the country, I mean, it can vary as low as down to about 25, 30% or as high as 45%, but 40 is the average. So that leaves you with 60%. 60% of 60,000 for the year is what? $36,000. That's simple. So that becomes your net operating income after you subtracted all that 40% operation costs. Now you ask yourself, well, how much is your debt, your mortgage? 
And the mortgage that we're talking about is just the debt on the loan. Yeah. You've, that 40% already covered the taxes and insurance. We're talking about just the debt on the loan. Mm -hmm. If you bought it cash, then that $36,000 a year is all in your pocket. That's all right. yours. Mm -hmm. If you didn't buy it cash and you leveraged it, meaning you got a loan on it. So let's just say you put $100,000 down, you owe $400,000 at, oh, uh, let's simple number at 6%. $400,000 at 6% is roughly $24-ish thousand dollars a year if it's just the interest portion. Well, you take the $36,000 and you subtract that debt of $24,000 and what do, you, what do you have left, you know? That's what your profit's going to be. Right. That's so simply, you got about $12,000 left in your pocket. Yeah. And so, so now you divide it by what you spent out of your pocket. And if you use the $100,000 example I gave you, then that's 12%. That's yep. what your return on investment is. And those are the quick things you do just off the top of your head. If it doesn't make sense, move on. Exactly. So a couple of things I want to cover from what you said. You mentioned the net <clears throat> operating income. And I just want our audience to understand that that's a very important number, the net operating income. Because when you go uh, to, a, to a, a lending company, a lending institution, a bank or savings and loan or credit union, they're going to want to know what that net operating income is, the NOI. And there's even a percent for that, too, that, you know, we can talk about on another day that if it doesn't meet a particular percentage, people aren't going to, the banks aren't going to be interested in you. But anyways, so they want to know what your net operating income is, number one. And then number two, of course, once you subtract out that loan, just remember that you could be on the positive side or you could be on the negative side, somewhere in, in between. So you got, you know, your break even zero. You could be on that negative side. You're you're putting money out of your pocket every month, or you could be on the positive side, and uh, you're actually bringing money into your pocket every month. Now, the decision that you have to make, depending on where it falls, is is it worth it to you? Is it worth it to make one or two or three percent? Is it worth it to you to lose one or two or three percent? And there are reasons for buying even then, right? Oh what yeah. Would, what would be a good reason? Let's say you bought a property. And, but you're you're putting out about a one percent every month, anyways. Why would that? Why would anyone want to do that? Yeah, if you have a property that you know has hidden value in it, but the current rents are low, it may be worth it for you to take that slight loss of income, meaning a negative cash flow, momentarily, for the bigger picture. So, for example, if you bought a beachside property you know that the value will always go up or any property where the current tenants are just well below market. The owner owned it for a long time. They had it paid off. They haven't raised rents in 20 years, which happened more frequent than you think. Yeah. Then you know that although you're taking a loss, there's 20 years of built up rent raises that hasn't been realized. And once you take it over and you're able to realize it, You've just all of a sudden took on an extra 20 years worth of increases in, as profits. Excellent. Yeah. So, yeah. So you have to make that decision because even, so, you know, depending on the, on the property, the market that you're in, maybe making even two and three and four percent may not be worth it for whatever reason. Right. And you just go, ah, it's not worth it. I need to be able to hit in this case, seven, eight, nine, 10 percent, whatever it's going to be. So excellent. So very quickly, uh, again, when you're evaluating a property and you don't want to waste too much time on it because you're not sure, the 1% rule uh, will tell you, is it worth taking that next step of, uh, of research, of evaluation? And then the, the quick and dirty steps that we talked about doing a quick little underwriting, uh, you can do that. Most You can do it in your head, probably, most likely, you know, you know, or if you just have a pen and pencil, scratch it out real fast depending on the numbers, and boom, you know whether it's worth pursuing even further. Now, mind you, uh, just because it pencils out uh, on that quick and dirty one doesn't mean it's going to really work, because then you really have to go and do your homework. you got to get the rent rolls. you got to get the actual cost. you got to figure out what your property taxes really are, because they're going to be different for every county. So don't think that just because it pencils out on a quick and dirty underwriting uh, case that you want to pull the trigger on it right away. You've got to do your homework. You've got to talk to people and you've got to make sure that you understand uh, the market, the property and where, I like what you said, where the hidden value may be in that property and then it's worth going after. 
Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And uh, I know there's a lot of naysayers out there that says, oh, the 1% rule doesn't exist anymore. That was that rule was created when the market was low in 2012, yada, yada, yada. I'm here to tell you that it's still around. You just yeah. got to look for it. And, you know, like anything else, price and terms. You can negotiate something down to the point where on your end, it'll meet or get darn close to that 1% rule in your head that you're looking for. Excellent. Okay. I think we, uh, I, th I think we put out some really good information for our audience here. I hope they're able to use it to evaluate properties very quickly, not waste any time on the ones that don't meet your criteria and then follow through on the ones that do and get that additional information. Any, any last thoughts before we sign off? I'd say, you know what, uh, come back next week and we'll dive into the net operating income. I, I love that. And I say also, like Sam said, I think one or two uh, videos ago, the best way to figure out how this works is by actually doing it. Oh, yeah. Go out there, find it and, uh, you know, do your homework and pull the trigger when it's time to pull the trigger.